this car is the most honest car you've ever seen. It's been a dream ever since I've had it. The first time I heard that engine screaming, I thought, I gotta have one of those. For me, the cars have personality. What's great about a BMW Classic is the community that surrounds it. When you listen to that, <laughs> that's why we're here. Welcome to our brand new episode of Classic Heart, the BMW Group Classic Podcast. My name is JP, and our guest today is Ben Clymer, the founder of the watch collecting platform Hoodinky. Ben is not only a dear friend over a decade now, he is also as passionate about cars as he is about watches. And we look very much forward to this conversation. And Ben, I think we have to celebrate something, because just a couple of days ago, if I'm not mistaken, two days ago, you got a very special award. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I actually I did get an award. I don't know if it was special, but I got an award, yes. Tell me more about that award, please, before we start. Sure. I didn't anticipate to talk about this, uh, nor did I think anybody would care about this, or me for that matter. But two days ago in New York City, there's something here called the Accessories Council, which is a nonprofit organization that basically supports the American Accessories Council. So that's watches, jewelry, sunglasses, anything that, that's not kind of foundational to luxury. It, you know, it's like a, I don't know, multi-billion dollar industry in the United States. And they were kind enough, and I think, or foolish enough to present me with an award called the Visionary Award, which is completely absurd in, in every regard. Uh, but I was, of course, happy to show up in a tuxedo on a Monday night in August and, and accept it. So obviously, really, really humbled to get that. And, you know, one of those kind of pinch me moments in this career of mine. So we know each other for quite a long time. And I have to say that you are an example of modesty in a sense, because Visionary Award fits absolutely perfectly well. <laughs> because you are... Good. No, it, it, it's not only kind, it's the truth, in my opinion. And I think I'm not the only one out there because you created something uh, for those maybe who are more on the car side of life because we come to the car stuff later, but I think they deserve to understand you and your background a little bit better. Yeah. You created a platform for watch enthusiasts called Hudinki. Tell us more about Hudinki and how this all started. Yeah. So Hodinki is really a platform for all people that love watches. And I think even more than that, a platform for people who like watches to begin to love them. And then similarly, people who don't know anything about watches to begin to like them. And I think what we've done well is take the idea and you guys do it very well at Classic Driver as well. Take the idea of enthusiast based, you know, loves, whether it's a car, it's a stereo equipment, it's watches, whatever, and professionalize it in a way that is worthy of sharing. And what I mean by that is that there's been historically, you know, whether it's in cars or watches or anything, there have been forums, which are really incredibly thorough and incredibly detailed platforms on which you can share content. But they were never professional. They were never beautiful. They were never thoughtfully designed. And they were never meant to be broadcast. And I think when when I look at the history of, I'll, I'll speak of watches simply because that's the world I know slightly better, you know, the, the watch forum world was really protective. It was really closed off. And it was almost like people were gatekeeping, which is a term that we use here in the U.S. a lot gatekeeping people away from falling in love with watches. In fact, it almost felt like a clique, like a little community that didn't want anybody else to join it. And that didn't feel right to me. And, you know, as I said in, in my speech on Monday night, and as I'll say here again, like both my parents were public school teachers. Like I didn't grow up with nice cars or nice watches or nice anything. And it was always really intimidating to me, even though I loved it from a design point of view and the history and the Paul Newman and, you know, all the cool guys. Um, and so I wanted to create a platform that was really accepting and a little bit irreverent and silly at times, but also we had the passion and we had the knowledge and eventually we had the, the relationships to create content and provide a shopping experience and, and a community experience that is just unrivaled. And I think we've done that in, in Hodinki. And now, you know, we see around 3 million people a month. You know, we do over $100 million in sales of watches on the internet every single year, which is shocking still to this day. And people love it. And I think, you know, we've been able to get more people excited about watches than ever before. And that, of course, extends also to other passionate areas such as cars and, and you know, mid-century furniture and other things that guys like us like to collect. And that's also the reason why we started Classic Driver in 1998. It was a pure passion thing at the very end. No business model behind it, nothing. It came just out of the interest for vintage cars. And you see it in the classic car departments of the manufacturers. Best way BMW Group Classic is now doing this podcast where we not only 
are obliged to speak about BMW, this comes very organic. So with all my guests we have here, it was always an organic talk about the passion for cars and things we like. And the internet has been, is, and will be a brilliant platform to communicate passion. So at the very end, all the things we do at your venture, at our venture, at BMW Group Classic and others is just communicating passion at the end. Yeah, that's it. And I think, you know, for me, it's as much about the product, whether we're talking about a, a 507 or a great Rolex Daytona, it's as much about that and the sharing of knowledge as it is about the community. And that sounds played out. It sounds hackneyed. It sounds trite in some ways, but that is in fact the power of, of at least Hodinki. I can speak to that. We have 400,000 people that comment on our site every single month on our site. I'm not talking about Instagram. I'm talking, they, they sign into their Hodinki accounts and they voice their opinion on every article that I write or that, you know, Danny or Cole or, or James writes on the site. And that's amazing. And look, sometimes they go after us. They say, we don't know what we're talking about. That's fine. It's part of the community. And I think, you know, providing that platform is really kind of incredible. And like, if you look at the largest businesses in the world, and I'll look at let, like, let's say, you know, WhatsApp or Instagram or Facebook, like the biggest companies in the tech space are those that provide platforms for other people to share their passions or communities or whatever. And I think, you know, that in, in many ways is what we've done, I think, really well. Definitely. And the internet community helped, of course, obviously. And, you know, it drives me still crazy that I'm sitting here at my kitchen table at three o'clock in the afternoon in Zurich and we have a conversation over the big pond over to Bedford where it's around eight o'clock in the morning and we don't even need to leave the house. But besides all that, we all need to get our coffee. So what car have you chosen for your first coffee run today? Today, I haven't left the house yet, but if I were to, so the car that I drive the most, and this is not a plant, is actually a BMW. It's an E39 M5, yes. which was the car that I grew up. You know, I was born in, in the early 80s, you know, the Guy Ritchie film with Madonna, you know, the transporter. It was, you know, this is nothing new for a lot of the BMW fans out there. But again, like I grew up in, in a place where it was really unlikely to see a car like an M5 on the road. It just, that was not something that people saw. A friend of mine's father had a 540i with a sport package, which is kind of the M5, but without the motor, basically. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. So the M5, the E39, was the car that I always wanted growing up. And then just this past year, I, I, I bought it. And that is now my daily car. And it's Oxford Green Metallic over tan. It's it's a perfect thing. Low miles, born uh, sold rather in Greenwich, Connecticut, which is kind of just across the border here for me. Um, one owner car. And it's the most perfect car. I, I don't think there's a better car in the world than an E39 M5, truly. You know, I remember one of my first driving events with BMW was driving the M5, um, uh, the E60. Mm -hmm. And we went to Fürstenfeldbruck, which is an old uh, military airport. And we had the landing strip. And man, this was like with launch control in this car. Poo, yeah. I was Just really like, blown away. So I understand totally yeah. um, how you fell in love with that. But did, how did you find the car? So the car kind of came to me, a friend of mine who's a, a broker in the area has known that I've wanted one, but you know, I'm a total nut. You know, I am one of those guys that like when I buy a watch, if it's on a new watch, it has to be a one owner watch and I have to know the owner. I want to know that it's real. I don't want to believe some auction house or something like that. Cars are, are the same way. And so, you know, you can buy an E39 and bring a trailer or wherever any day of the week. But I wanted a low mile, original paint, one owner car. And this one, as I mentioned, was sold in Greenwich, Connecticut at a very famous retailer here or distributor here that's no longer around called Motorsport Competition in Greenwich, which is famous in the area. Wow. And then it, it lived in, in Bedford, New York, which is kind of where I live here, which is just across the border with one person who I've since met. And so the idea that this car and by the way, it has 28,000 miles on it, you know, so wow. it's basically like a new car. And so... This car was it was just kind of too perfect. And I've come so close to buying an E39 because it really was the car that I lusted for in, in high school the most. And this one was just kind of too good to pass up. And so I bought it and now I drive it almost every day. You know, we have serious winters up here, so I'll probably put it away for the winter and hop over into my Defender or something else. But uh, it's my daily car. I have other cars. I have other BMWs for sure for the weekends. But this is the car I take. I, I was in New York for that award that you mentioned. I took my E39 M5. We all saw this on Instagram, the gram telling you everything. <laughs> it's a true story. So Ben, but tell us, what is your story with BMW? My story with BMW is an interesting one. As I said, both my parents were, you know, I'll spare you the details, but effectively teachers in, in Rochester, New York, which is nothing like New York City. You know, it's a really a different place. But my father and mother were like 
you know, I don't even hesitate to say this. They were like really, really cool before I was born and before my older sister was born. And then I think we kind of like, you know, caused them to, you know, change their lifestyle significantly. So the very first car my mother owned new from a dealer in, in Long Island was a 2002. It was her first car ever. My grandfather was into cars. He had some great Mercedes and and other great cars. And he wanted his daughter to drive a great European car. So he bought her a 2002. And she was so angry with him because what she wanted was a Carmen Ghia of all things. She just wanted, who knows why, but she wanted a Carmen Ghia. And the family story is that she cried when she got her BMW, which of course (laughs) we love to make fun of her about. So she had a 2002 in orange and I've got photos of it. And it's just like, wow, like my mom was driving a 2002 in 1970, which, you know, in the history of BMW in the United States, that is early days. Yes. Um, and then my father ended up, after they sold the 2002, you know, then life went on. He bought a Bavaria, which is, a, you know, obviously a, a four-door car. And so there were always these photos of them driving these amazing BMWs around my house. And we even, I don't know how, we kept some of the keys to the 2002 and the Bavaria. And I still have them to this day. I mean, they're sitting five feet away from me. And I was always a car guy. As a, a kid, you know, whose parents drove... Toyota Camrys and American cars. We had a Cadillac at one point. We had a, a cool Volvo or two. I'm nothing against Volvos. I, those are great cars. But I always lusted for like this lifestyle that was kind of like BMW centric because, of course, my mom had one of the first 2002s on the East Coast back then. Wow. And so always, always wanted something like that. And we shall not forget to mention your BMW 2800 CS. Yep. The 2800 CS has become kind of my country club cruiser. And I live most of the time north of New York City in, in a small town in Westchester that is really very remote. I mean, it's really farm-like up here, you know, a lot of horse country and, and things like that. And so this car is really my country club cruiser. So when my wife and I go down to play tennis or golf at the local country club or go have dinner out, you know, that's the car we take. And it is in the colors that it is, which is kind of beige over beige, which is just so 70s, almost corduroy seats. You know, it just elicits so much kind of joy out of people. And I think, you know, in the U.S. there is, you know, th- there's something that is, I don't want to say... It's certainly not forbidden, but, you know, slightly negative about sh- like kind of I'll say showy cars, yes. you know, air quote showy cars. But the 2800 is not that. In fact, even my more kind of obscure crazy BMWs are, are not that. And I think I've never received a negative reaction to any of the BMWs because they are so beautiful. And I think other cars that I've owned, I've owned Ferraris, I've owned Lanchas and Alphas and, and other kind of more exotic things. Those cars tend to they can elicit joy, but they can also elicit kind of like an eye roll as well. And the BMW in particular, the 2800 and the M5, just, you know, they make people excited because it reminds them of kind of like of a more beautiful time. Absolutely. But did you ever tell your mother that the 2800 CS has been built at Karman in Germany? <laughs> What's funny is no, I, I have not, but I need to tell her that for sure. Please tell her that, you know, mom, when next time she's crying that she got, didn't get a Karman to say, you know, it could be even better, mom. Because my car <laughs> has been built by Carmen. <laughs> That's amazing. That, that, that is absolutely. It, it's so funny. Like my, my father, who is not at all a car guy, even though he was driving in 2002 in a Bavaria. You know, I've had some, if I may say, some crazy cars, Zagato cars and, for, yeah. you know, vintage Ferraris, like really like kind of wild stuff. The only car that got him excited at all is the 2800. Yeah, The only one. I mean, that's the only car he's ever asked to drive. The only car he ever wanted to know the history of. Uh, it just shows that, that like, you know, once a BMW guy, kind of always a BMW guy. But yeah, that is a, it's a really special car and and, and just one I'll, I'm going to keep for a long time. Yeah, this is definitely a keeper, 100%. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a question about the uh, 2002. Uh, you said it was orange. I hope it was Inca orange. Do you remember? I believe it was. I, I believe it was. Nice. And I tell you, you know, and again, another story, and I think I would never allowed to visit your home, especially if your mother's around, because my mother's <laughs> uh, second car when she got married to my father was a, a 202 Bauer convertible. So I grew up in that. I said, my, you know, I, my father was always French cars. He never understood the passion for my mother's German side in terms of cars. That's funny. Uh, but the Bauer convertible, this was really something special, uh, I remember, because, that's you a, know. That's a beautiful car. It is, yeah, rarely. You don't see them very often around anymore. So I don't know what happened to them. So it's really like, yeah. <laughs> so the two, 202 is a fantastic car. And then having it as a Bauer, it was really like, and it was white, Alpine white. So that's uh, all I remember. I was very little uh, when we had that. But uh, that's um, my memories as well. So there's a bit of BMW childhood history here as well. Um, ben, if I might say, give you another E, I say E26. What does it uh, mm-hmm. makes you feel when I say E26? E26 is, uh, that's a good one. That, that's a very, very good one. No, no, no question about it. It's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about recently, we'll say. 
I think it's not just thinking. Because I remember a post recently on Instagram at your account with loads of BMW M1 documents and other stuff. So yeah, is yeah. there a so secret there, plan? There's something, <laughs> there, there's something coming up called, uh, you guys can't see this because it's not on video, but there's a, a box that I'm showing JP called the quail that says the quail on it right now. So I've got a friend named Phil who several years ago, I had a Lancia, I still have a Lancia Flaminia Zagato. Uh, and that car was in the shop basically all summer. And he said, you know what, take my M1 and just have fun with it. And I said, okay, you know, dr <laughs> yeah. dream car, sure, why not? And so he gave me the opportunity to spend real time with an yes. M1, you know, really, really, you know, get not just a like, drive around the corner, but like really like take it on the highway, like, you know, have weeks with it. And I said, oh man, this car is so good. I mean, the M1 is, is just... It's a supercar almost for a guy that would never be caught dead in a supercar, yes. if that makes any sense, which I think is who I am. You know, I'm a pretty conservative, laid back guy that like I'm just not a showy person. And I think, you know, I have the ambition to drive something that is just wildly exciting. But I'm also not the guy to show up in an F40 or something like that. And so I kind of went out searching for an M1. But, you know, as you well know, JP, like cars kind of tend to find you. Yes. And I came very close to buying several like very, very mediocre M1s over the years. I mean, really just like cars that, you know, the, the cars are fiberglass, as, as many of you know. And, you know, they're difficult to buy, to be honest. And I ended up finding a car through a friend from the original owner, a British gentleman who ended up bringing it into the Hamptons, you know, which is a few hours away from me here. And I bought an M1 this year. And it's an incredibly original, low mile, fully documented car in blue, which is the color I wow. wanted. And so I'll be showing it at the Quail this year in the 50 years of M uh, of M class. And definitely I'm going to stop by because the Quail, the motorsport gathering, is one of my fixed appointments around the Monterey Classic Car Weeks. And so I'm looking forward that we see each other under the Californian sun oh, I and I can wait. have a closer look on your BMW M1. Sure. So, you know, when you speak about cars, of course, we speak heavily about BMW. But it's not intentional. It just came through so that everyone understands this because we love everything that has four wheels. But the way you speak about this reminds me on our dear friend Guy Berryman from Coldplay because this guy... Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. So Guy is someone who's really diving into the history of the cars he wants to buy or he's interested in purchasing. Yeah. Is this, do you think it's because of your journalistic background that you also want to dive into it? Yeah, I mean, I think Guy is a, is an inspiration and I, you know, he's an amazing collector and amazing, you know, amazing taste yes. level. And I have the same kind of appreciation for history. And, you know, he's obviously a musician. I was at one point a journalist. I went to journalism school. There, there's no question that the stories mean a lot to me. And in many cases, a lot of the watches that mean the most to me are not the rarest, but ones that have stories and the cars would be the same. But I want to know everything. Yeah. And, you know, the reason we're talking about BMW so much, and this is completely, you know, unsponsored, this is organic, yeah. is I've bought three BMWs in the past 12 months. And so, you know, BMW is something that I have have a deep passion for now. I've had seriously deep passions for other brands along the way. Porsches, a big one, Zagato cars, is, as you know, something that I yes. just love. But yeah, for me, it is absolutely about the story. And I think, you know, one of my favorite cars that I still own that has one of the best stories for me is I've got an Alfa Romeo Sprint Zagato, you know, the little kind of like jelly yes, bean looking love thing it. from the 60s. And I'm an unrestored car guy. Like I basically will not touch a car if it's I don't want to say repainted, but been restored and kind of put back together a few times. And so I was able to find an unrestored Sprint Zagato, which is even rarer than finding an unrestored M1 because these cars were aluminum and they were race cars and they were kind of put together in a junky way. And like, you know, they were just really beaten up for and they were not very expensive for a long time in a particular period. And so I bought this car that really looks terrible. I mean, it really like the paint is falling off. You know, it's all it's not rusted, but, you know, the, the bare metal showing through the plastic windows have spidering. I mean, it's really in kind of like rough shape. But the car was originally sold to a guy named Johnny Bulgari, last name Bulgari. It gives you an idea where we're heading. Okay. Um, who, <laughs> of course. Yeah, he is still very much alive. And I work with Bulgari and Hodinki is an authorized dealer for Bulgari and they're owned by LVMH. And we, we know these guys. And so I said, oh, man. So I emailed the contact of mine at Bulgari and I said, any chance you can put me in touch with Johnny? And they said, of course, Johnny is no longer involved with the business, but here's his contact. So I contacted him and we've become very good friends. And Johnny Bulgari was 
at one point the heir to Bulgari, you know, in the yeah. 70s. He was the creative director. He was the CEO. He was actually kidnapped. I mean, he was a real like um, like a bon vivant, like a real like gentleman racer in period. And he drove the, the Sprint Segato. He drove a TZ. He drove a 250 GTO. He had 904s. I mean, this guy was living a great life in the 1960s. And so he has become a friend and told me so much about my car. It's just remarkable. And he raced the car heavily from 1960 to 62, just two wow. years. But I mean, competed in probably 20 different races, mostly in Italy, some in France, including the Targa Florio two times. And then he sold it to somebody else and competed again in the Targa Florio. And the car remains in the exact condition it was when it ran Targa Florio in 1963. And so... You know, we've kept in touch. He sent me probably a hundred plus photographs of the car that I didn't have, which was like they didn't exist in the history file. And it was amazing because he was of the means to have photographers, you know, photograph his races and his car, et cetera, back in period, which is just incredible. And then when I was in Rome last year to actually pick up another Italian car, a 330 GTC from an original yeah. owner, we had lunch. And so I got to meet him in person. And, you know, a lot of the stuff, you know, COVID kind of made travel yeah. very difficult for me. So I got to see him and we had lunch. And he told me more about the car. And so there's a photo that I have of myself as the current owner of the Sprint Segato and one with Johnny as well, the, the original owner of the Sprint Segato. And it's just kind of an amazing thing to have direct access to the original owners of these cars. And with the exception of maybe one or two, all of the cars I bought over the past five years, I have direct lines to the original owners or at least the long-term owners of the cars. That makes it so special because I think for me, this is also what it's again. I say this every time. I, I just hate myself repeating, but it's that's what's all about. Otherwise, if you don't have these stories, it's just right. a piece of rubber and, in, in some cases, fiberglass and some cases, aluminium. Yeah. Um, but I remember also like the Bulgaris, and I never met Johnny, but um, you know, I went to Nicola's car collection in Rome, and he's uh, one of the largest collector of Pope cars. Yes. So he has one of the. Have you been there? I, I haven't been there, but I've been to his collection here in Pennsylvania. Uh, he's also a huge collector of American yes. cars. Yes, absolutely. No, he loves that. And what I like, this is what I was asking. So in Pennsylvania, what he does there is really like remarkable because he's supporting young people becoming restorers and car mechanics, understanding the old mechanics that this art form is not getting lost. So yes. we can't value enough what he's doing. And the funny thing is, which I learned while visiting the, the collection in Rome, which is in a very like ordinary underground place yeah. uh, somewhere, of course, Italy we don't disclose, uh, what I learned is that the uh, Vatican cars were always American cars. Only lately <laughs> they started switching to things like Mercedes and stuff like that. Yeah. It was all like American cars. And they kept it as a time capsule. And of course you need to because God's hands on earth were driving in that car. So how could you ever dare to change something if you have such an important passenger as the Pope in your car. So you don't want to get lost of anything that has been included to this big history of the cars. But for you personally, is it restored or rather unrestored cars that interests you? The, the idea of restoring cars feels really passe to me. And I think, you know, it's a generation before ours. And there are yeah. several extremely notable, the most famous car collectors in the world that love to restore cars. Like that is their passion. Yes. That's fine. I think those cars will really struggle to retain value over the next generation, you know, when guys like us Agreed. kind of continue to rise here. And I think it is so easy to find a restored anything, whatever it is. I mean, the, the first great unrestored car I owned was in 1965. So first year, first production year, 911. Yeah. You can buy a 65 or 66 911, again, any day of the week to find an unrestored one. Impossible. You know, through that car, I learned so much about the 911 that I think, frankly, a lot of people, at least in this country, were completely unaware of because I started going on the forums and finding that, you know, Mustang, for example, I'm sorry, but the Mustang came out the same year. So Porsche decided when they came into the U.S. to label every single year, every single 911 as a 66. So even the 65s were labeled 66 when they were registered. There's so much in originality that is just lost when things are restored and taken apart. And as I said, I think, you know, I'm unrelenting, certainly in the story, but also unrelenting in the condition of a car. And restored cars at this point don't do a single thing for me. And I think that's a struggle because, for example, like the, the Pinin Freenet uh, 230 Mercedes, like if that car were unrestored, that would be a car that would be really appealing to me. Yeah. It's been taken apart and put back together a few times and it's done expertly. But for me, it just holds no appeal. This is the biggest challenge for all the massive collections where they don't find the next generation of taken care of. Uh, we mentioned the Quail is uh, organized by uh, Sir Michael Dory and uh, with the great support of our dear friend Philip. So I think that is one of the 
great examples how the next generation will take care yeah. of the collection. But, you know, with many others, and we saw great collectors sadly passing uh, this year, like Simone and, and others. And I see, like, it's going to be really tough because, as you said, I agree, these kind of over-restored trailer queens, mm -hmm. and I don't mean it in an offensive way, don't get me wrong, I like to watch and look at a great car, but let's go even down with Land Rovers, right? right? You know, if you want to buy a Defender, like from the, so I, I'm drinking from the Huey Cup, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the Huey 166 is, for those who are not knowing, is the uh, number plate of the prototype of the, uh, of the predecessor of the first, first Land Rover. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't get them in original condition anymore. Even yeah. like the worst machine, they're yeah. all done and... That's not for me. You know, there are my people out there who like that, but the moment your car is super restored, and I think that's the uh, equation, you don't use it because you're right. afraid of every chip, of yep. every scratch, of everything. Yeah, and I, I think it's just, it goes back to stories and soul. You know, soul, I'm, you, again, you can't see because I'm we're on video here, but like the soul that you can feel between your thumb and your forefinger, something that like feels good to people. And I think, yep. you know, my Alfa Romeo as the example, like again, most people think that car looks terrible and like this oh you need to paint it it needs to be restored etc but somebody like yourself or somebody that that really understands cars like they fall in love with it and that car of all the cars that i own elicits the most positive reaction from people who really understand cars and history because around the target florio i think there's really going to be a change and you know a few of the american sports car magazines have written about it in the past five years you know seinfeld bought a very expensive unrestored speedster some years ago and that was kind of like that i think i wouldn't say a market shift but started to get people to pay attention. And I think, you know, there are more and more people like me and like you that just are completely uninterested in restored cars. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have to say, in all fairness, the, the example I bring now is on the extreme side. But I remember it must be Monterey week eight years ago, nine years ago. Okay. I was walking down when they did the uh, the Pebble Tour and they stopped buying Carmel so I was walking like the off streets because that's most interesting because the, you will see the car on the lawn anyway. Right. So going like the streets left and right, that's the most interesting part. Mm -hmm. And there was this young chap with his speedster completely ran down, completely uh, Matt Hummel, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think for me, and he became then like, okay, we did a story about him as well because we sent Remy over to take photos and people were giving us shit for celebrating someone who has a speedster, completely rusty, rotten seats, everything done. You know, I said, that's the other extreme. I'm not into that, but I think this was the kickoff for also to understand, to yeah. keep this as a time capsule. Yeah, and I, right? I think it's funny. Like, I was, I had some work done on my, I've got a 330 GTC that was a one or two owner car, you know, original paint, original everything. And I was having some work done to it. And my friend goes, well, I thought it was unrestored. And I was like, look, unrestored doesn't mean not maintained, right? Like, it, it's exactly. it's quite the opposite. Like, you're maintaining something in some ways much better than you would with a restored car. Yeah. And so it's just about kind of keeping the bare metal together, keeping the paint original, not doing anything unnecessary. And I think that's what's so kind of frustrating at times is so much of the restoration work done these days is completely unnecessary. And again, it, it voids yes. the car of, of the charm that I think they have organically. Yeah. My Alpha, even though it is completely original, was so after Johnny sold it to the next gentleman who raced it, you know, they had teams back then, as, as you, sh you know, surely know. And the team color was a dark red. And so they painted the car dark red. So this car, my Alpha, weirdly, is not original paint, but it was basically spray painted in 1963 for the Tiger Florio. And I'm, we're going to keep it that way forever. No question yeah. about it done and if you like this kind of original cars you know there's going to be a great place that's going to open its doors uh, soon in uh, germany it's a new car museum it's called nationales auto museum the low collection so for everyone listening in if you have the chance try to find out when the nationales auto museum will open its gates because this place this place is such a great spot for car enthusiasts. You will see so many fantastic cars you've never seen before in public. And we are so happy that the collector decided to make his collection accessible to the public. So everyone who's listening in, just send me the dates and we all move over there. But what also interests me, Ben, I mean, you travel a lot. You just became a young father. You have now a small family. And you have a very well-running business with Hodinki. How do you split your time between cars and watches? Is it 
You know, now it's probably more cars than watches. Uh, so there's a big difference there. And I think like, you know, I love watches as much as anybody, probably too much, but it's work, you know, and I am still very much an employee of Winky Inc. And, you know, it feels different. There are so many watches that bring me so much joy, but there's also the frustrations of, of any job. And I'm sure you, you experienced it at Classic Driver. Like <laughs> there's a difference between work and passion. Cars to me is fun. Cars to me is escape. Cars to me is friends. It's a drive. It, it is pure enjoyment. I'm going to the Quail, as, as mentioned earlier, and I'm shipping the M1 to L.A., and then we're driving actually up from L.A. to Pebble. That is fun. That's, that is literally uh, what we call PTO in the U.S., which is paid time off. So yeah. I am taking time off away from my job to go do that. Why is there this connection between cars and watches? And I would like to add something to that question. Sure. Is it a marketing thing purely because some of the collaborations look like ridiculously stupid, <laughs> others quite okay, mm -hmm. but there was never one collaboration where I would say, yes, man, you understood completely the car side yeah. of the business. How would you rate this kind of yeah. marketing activities? I think to answer your first question, like the connection is completely organic. And I think, you know, the idea of like mechanical gauge focused operational tools that have now become kind of like luxury objects, they are similar in that. And they are multi-generational. They are, you know, they're the legacy focused devices. And there's not that many that, that men can really focus on art, design, engineering. You guys get all that. But I think in terms of the collaborations, I think it's seldom done well. I think there are some Watches that, that make sense. You know, there was a great Porsche design piece that, that came out this year for the, the GP ice race that I thought was pretty cool. I actually bought one of those. But I think, you know, the watches that have the best stories are the ones that were built from an organic kind of relationship. Yeah. And you have to remember, and I know you know this, but I'll say it anyway, that before 1969, there was no such thing as quartz time telling or digital time telling. So when you were running Le Mans in 1955 or the Mille Miglia in 1955, Sterling Moss, et cetera, like... They were using stopwatches. They were using mechanical chronographs, whether on wrist or on, you know, on, on a clipboard. And that, to me, is the purest expression of the relationship. And so when I do rallies, which I do occasionally here in the U.S., I ensure that, of course, I have my iPhone so that if we break down, I can call somebody. But I don't reference it at all. And I use a Hoyer stopwatch or a Daytona like I'm wearing. And I really want to experience the cars the way the drivers were in period. And so if I'm driving a 330 GTC, which is 1968, I use something from that period. If I'm driving my Lancia from, which is really 1959, I use something from that period. And I think those are the relationships that are the most compelling. And of course, there are people trying to capitalize on that. You know, I shouldn't say as they should, but I understand why they do, whether it's our friends at Tag Hoyer with, with Porsche these days or Chopard with Emilia Emilia. I understand it. I mean, there's a one-to-one -one relationship there. And I think if done well, it can make, excuse me, a lot of sense. And when you look at Rolex and their connection to, to Formula One and Daytona, it makes sense. Hoyer, for sure. I think Hoyer, in fact, has the most authentic relationship with motorsport of any watch brand. And I don't think people really understand that. And if you go back to Formula One in the 60s and 70s, it was all Hoyer. Rolex was barely there. Of course. I mean, really. Of course. Um, and so it frustrates me sometimes when I see people kind of bashing Tag Heuer for working in the in the car space when they have the most legitimate place there of, of any of any watch brand. I agree. And this is you mentioned two of them, which is Heuer, definitely hundred percent. You know, Jack Hoyer tried to save the company by going into motorsport, right? right. So yeah. measuring time and stuff like that. So yes, 100%. And I can stand saying, okay, Hoyer and Porsche are doing something together. Mm -hmm. Fine, right? Rolex, same deal. Of course, being a long time part of the awards you will receive when you won a race. Right. And, you know, we know many stories about uh, gentleman drivers and professional drivers that were Rolexes before sponsoring was even a big thing, I think it's fair to say. But that's all like overall. So this is motorsport and watch. And now when they try to make the connection between a watch and a specific car or even a model of a car, I think that doesn't work. It's just, anyway, like, but... <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, it's as, as somebody... Look, I mean, my job, the way that we pay our bills at Hodinki is we sell things. Like, we sell watches. Yeah. And I'm proud of it. And I think the idea of... You know, if you see somebody that can afford a McLaren or whatever, a Ferrari, you know, and the idea of just like dangling something in front of them simply because you can, to me, is feels like it's advantageous. Like, you, like there, there's not yeah. there. There are a lot of wealthy people in this world. There are not that many wealthy people in this world that want to spend money on silly things like cars and watches. And so people tend to get overexcited and overstimulated by the idea that, OK, this person bought a four hundred thousand dollar car. I'm sure he wants a four hundred thousand dollar watch. That is not at all no. true at all. Yeah. And, you know, nothing wrong with marketing. And I think of the idea of it is more that those people who might 
not be able yet affording a McLaren or a Ferrari or whatever, mm -hmm. um, they have a little bit of a feeling they could. Right. And coming back to the Porsche design, that's the second, or the, I mentioned two brands, which was Hoyer and Rolex, but Porsche design really is legit. Of and course. there's no, I don't allow any discussion about this one. I agree with you as well, because, yeah. you know, F.A. Alexander Porsche was the guy who has designed the 911, for God's sake. Right. And yes, he said, all the watches are a distraction. I want the watch. And this was where he came up with a black watch. It's mm -hmm. not like, uh, if, uh, I, I think that was completely crazy at that time doing a black watch, but it they was. must think he was nuts. Um, anyways, I would like to jump back because I'm still fascinated by the M1. And just lately, I just in, uh, jumped into it too much. For the blue M1, you will show in at the Quail. What is the best watch to wear in that car? <laughs> so it's funny you mention that. I actually, I have, I don't know if you know this, but a company called Bueller, which made uh, any digi mechanical, or it's basically mechanical or quartz rather, analog display and digital display watches. They made watches for Tissot as well. They actually made a watch for M1 drivers to wear in 1979 wow. and 1980. And I have one. Uh, so wow. there's that. You know, that will be with me for sure at, at Quail. To be honest with you, you know, the car isn't a product of the 80s. I'm a product of the 80s. My birth year watch, which is actually what I wore on Monday night to the award ceremony, is a gold 6263 Daytona, which is like, it's a total kind of fuck you watch. It's a total like, you know, like, you know, big dog watch. But yeah. if you're driving an M1 in 1980 or 82, you probably are wearing a gold Daytona too. Uh, so there's a chance that, that that might go with it. Weirdly, I will say... And I know it's odd, but I actually think the Porsche design goes really well with the M1 as well. So, Ben, your car collection, I call it collection because I don't have a better word for it. Like sure. this passion, this passion garage, I would say, <laughs> um, is mainly consistent of uh, European cars. Yeah. When is the first U.S. car coming or did I miss one? No, I've never had an American car as an adult. There are several with which I'm fascinated, several that I would love to own They are, of course, hard to find. And I think if you find me a great C2 Corvette, unrestored in a great color, I'll mm. buy it. With the documentation, with the original sales, I'll buy that. No question about it. Same thing with an early Mustang, you know, obviously a Shelby. A okay. friend of mine, Matt Jacobson, who is uh, kind of in the car world a little bit with Porsches, uh, he has an amazing unrestored Shelby Mustang that he just got. Wow. You know, they're few and far between. And I think there are other ones that I would love to own, like a Cunningham C2. Briggs Cunningham is kind of a, you know, kind of a personal hero of mine. And I actually know somebody with a Cunningham here. Yeah. They're a little trucky. That's kind of the, the issue sometimes with, with American cars is they are, they're not exactly nimble, but there's a charm in that. And I think, you know, I live in a place where there's a lot of twisty and small roads and American cars just don't do that well there. But a great Corvette, a great Mustang, um, you know, great Ford Bronco. Another car that I loved in high school, which you're going to laugh at because I don't even know if you ever even had them, was the Ford Explorer Eddie Bauer edition. What? Yeah, exactly. Ford Explorer, which was like an early SUV for us, they did Eddie Bauer, which is kind of like, it was like a B-list or C-list Ralph Lauren competitor at best. I mean, really at best. And they did a collaboration in the 90s, and I thought the Eddie Bauer edition Ford Explorer was just the coolest thing on earth. No question. That's just nostalgia. That's like my E39. But American cars, like I just think they focused on dramatically different things for a really long time than what I get excited about. And like for better or worse, like I do care about precision. I do care about engineering. I do care about craftsmanship. And American cars struggled with that. And I think they're getting better today. But when you compare an E39 to an American car at the time, I mean, even just from a design, look, look at them on a white piece of paper. I mean, like you just can't even, they're yeah. not even close. But again, you know, a great C2, a great early Mustang would definitely be compelling to me. No question. And then of course, they're like, They're not compelling for me now, but I could see as my family gets older and or gets bigger, potentially, you know, a big old Cadillac would be a lot of fun. And you say Cadillac. And that reminds me of a dear friend of yours, Eric Clapton, who's not only a car collector, he also has a big love for watches. Yeah. And I tell you that on the cover of the album Riding with the King of Eric Clapton and B.B. King, mm -hmm. there is his 66 Cadillac convertible. And you know what? This car is so brilliant because it's, for me, the epitome of the American dream car. Yeah. So that's America riding down Highway 101, down with that car. That must be absolutely fantastic. So even though the album is very old now, it still stuck to my head to have the chance to ride one time in this Cadillac. Maybe you can make that possible. And we can invite Eric Clapton to join us for another session of this podcast. 
Okay, it's a deal. It's a deal for sure. No, I mean, it's, you know, Clapton, I mean, speaking of collectors, I mean, Clapton is the consummate collector of everything. And I've been lucky enough to actually, I, I, I bought one of his watches years ago, a Louis 1463 that he owned. Um, wow. There are some people that just kind of like define the idea of collecting and Clapton is certainly one of them for, for cars and watches. Great. Um, for you, is it the mechanic or the look slash design of a car that appeals to you? The, the answer, which would be expected, would be both. I think the look is the look is the mm. face, right? It's like when you meet your wife, when you meet your husband, like you look at their face first. So I think that is paramount. And I think if you don't like the look, you're not going to buy the car, no matter how no matter how fast it is or how perf you know perfect the motor is. So looks come first for sure, and then the story. And the mechanics and the motor and the transmission and all that kind of coming together, I think, you know, it, it all has to work. Like everything, it's a complete package. But if you're not attracted to the design of anything, car, watch, human, house, you know, yeah. sneaker, pants, you're not going to dedicate time or money to, to, to pursuing them. Um, what is your best drive? Is it like the morning run for coffee run or what is the best drive for you? Yeah, I feel very lucky because there are so many great roads in this area and I have so many friends. But to me, the best drive is around my house. Uh, I've got a very young daughter, you know, going to get coffee from my family in the morning to a place called Hayfields, which has become kind of a hangout up here in New York, uh, which is 10 minutes up the road from me. I take the Ferrari or the Alpha on a Sunday morning by myself and go get coffee for the family and bring it right back. And that to me is is a perfect drive. It's not a long drive, but the roads are great. Route 121 in North Salem, New York. Really incredible. There are other drives that are far more exotic that I've done, you know, probably sexier to most people. A drive that I love doing and I have to give full kind of props and shout out to the folks of the Copper State 1000, uh, which is a drive that begins in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, which is a place I'd frankly never been to before doing this drive. And now I make a point of doing this drive. It, it's been different because of COVID, but before COVID, I was doing it every year. Yeah. Uh, and this goes either north from Phoenix and Scottsdale to the Grand Canyon. Wow. Which is just, have you ever, have you been to the Grand Canyon? I just flew with a helicopter through it. That's like, that <laughs> that's a very JP response. Um, no, it is, uh, I mean, it's mind blowing. The scale of it is just incredible. And so to be able to, I, yeah. I drove my Flaminia to the Grand Canyon once. I drove my 65911 there. I've driven a 356 there. So to do the Grand Canyon and then come back down and then go to the southern border, which is the Mexican border, you know, in two or three days in a classic car with 85 or, you know, 50 to 85 other classic cars. It's just amazing. And that was the service part of our podcast, uh, like for everyone who wants to bring ship their cars over to the US or listeners who live in the US and uh, want to do something special. Copper State it is. Here we go. And unfortunately... Uh, ben, we have to end our convo, which could go on and on and on, but we have to make a stop point here. So thank you so much for joining. Such a pleasure, as usual. And I cannot wait to meet each other in person in the US. Thank you very much for joining in at Classic Heart, the BMW Group Classic Podcast. Thank you, JP. It was a lot of fun. Thank you.